to be invited to St. Petersburg and the Hermitage to tell you uh, a little bit about Artec. Artec is a sales and propaganda center for the new housing ideology. That's quite a statement. And it was made by Nils Gustav Hall in 1935, and he was one of the four co-founders of Artec. And um, these co-founders were the two architects, the architect couple, Alvar and Aino Alto, Mr. Ha Mr. Hall, who was an art historian, and Mayre Gullichsen, who was an art patron, an art collector, and, um, and an industrial heiress. And these four people came together in 1935 in Helsinki, so nearly exactly 80 years ago, to start maybe one of the most unusual and most ambitious project in the history of furniture design. Really, the, the name is programmatic. Yeah? Art tech, composed of art and technology. Um, and this was obviously a, an idea that was part of the modernist movement of the time. There's this famous saying by Walter Gropius, the director of the Bauhaus, who spoke of art and technology, a new unity. And the idea was by infusing technology by art, technology would become more inspired. And by bringing technology into art, art would become more tangible. So the founders of Artec took this artificial name um, as a programmatic title for what they were trying to set up. So what were they trying to do? Well, they um, put up a little document, which we call the manifest. And uh, probably you would today call it, call it something like a mission statement. What they said is about centrally three things. Artec is a platform for modern art, industry, and interior design, and propaganda. So they wanted to make Artec a place where through exhibitions and other means of education, um, they would sell furniture and promote a new way of living, a new culture of living. Under propaganda, um, we would probably understand today education, so they meant by that providing trade journals and also publishing their own um, magazines or periodicals. Modern art, the idea was to bring the art of the time, which has never been seen in Finland, to Artec and introduce it to the Finnish audience. And by industry and interior, interior design, um, the world furniture doesn't show up in this whole document. But what's, what was meant by that was standard types, so standardized furniture, interior design, or other building units and systems, lighting, that you need to make a home or that you need to make an interior. And their way of introducing this was um, exhibitions. So they wanted to do permanent exhibitions, so there should be a permanent showroom, and they wanted to do um, temporary exhibitions um, through which they would introduce very special things, either introduced by Artec or found by Artec abroad. Um, then the document speaks a bit more of the Alto products. So Artec should be the place where you could exclusively uh, find the products by Alvar Alto. And they would also be able to export it uh, abroad. And uh, you see, in the end, all these uh, arrows come to together for increased worldwide activity. So in a nutshell, they believe that through design art and architecture, you could make the world a better place. And they felt that in Finland, which was a very young nation, it became independent only in 1917, Arctic should be this platform where you could discover this new living culture. But they also wanted to bring their ideas of modernism abroad, mainly through the furniture, lighting, and other products of Alvaro Alto. This was the first Arctic store in 1936, which you recognize mainly by the car. <laughs> but you see um, that the furniture um, was combined with Moroccan carpets, uh, accessories, lighting, flowers. So it was already 
um, quite a multi-layered presentation, which is something that in 1935 no one had ever seen uh, in Finland. So that was the design and interior design aspect of it. But they also organized exhibitions. So they would empty out the store and bring art. So the first exhibition on Fernand Léger and Alexander Calder in Helsinki was organized by um, Artec in 1937. And this is a beautiful document we found only, re only recently, which is a letter that uh, Fernand Léger wrote to his students. So he said, um, work well and uh, make progress even if I'm not there. And he wrote it on the Arctic letterhead because apparently he spent many weeks um, in Helsinki to set up his exhibition. Later on, there were many other exhibitions on Picasso, um, Miro, and also after the 1950s, there was a separate art gallery. So there, there was still the Arctic store, the furniture store, and it was combined next to it with the um, art uh, gallery. And here we see some other um, invitations to these exhibitions. This was now an exhibition actually on design, where you, where you see that um, Artec did not only show and sell auto furniture, but they also brought um, the works of other like-minded designers to Helsinki. Mare Gullikson, she was the one who was really driving the art side of Artec. So she was, oops, sorry. She was the, um, she was the founding director and then also the managing director of the um, Artec Gallery. And um, Mr. Hall, who said this Artec is a propaganda center, he also said Artec is an organism, uh, Alto is the soul, and I am the hand. So he considered himself the, the one who makes things happen, but Alto was the one who was dreaming them up. So I thought I would show you a bit um, who Alvar and I know Alto were and what they were actually doing. Um, I don't know who of you have seen the exhibition because a lot of um, his work can actually be seen here. Um, but he can be counted among the rationalist uh, architects. But I think the big difference is that he had an organic approach to it, a very human approach to modernist architecture, always thinking about the individual in the center of his buildings. And the one project that really catapulted him on an international scene was the Paimio Sanatorium, which he designed in Turku in the late 1920s. So we're talking late 1920s, there is no antibiotics. So the only cure against uh, tuberculosis was rest, sun, fresh air. So he built in the middle of the birch forest um, this building, which was really like a total environment. He designed everything from the color concept, where he chose a yellow floor to bring sunshine also inside the building to the railings, uh, the lighting fixtures, the rooms, obviously. And everything was designed in a way to, to give the patients a maximum uh, chance of healing and relaxation. And he also designed specific furniture. This was meant for people to lie back and open their lungs so that they could breathe better. Uh, the second project, which uh, gave him a lot of um, also notoriety on an international level, was the library that he built in Vyborg, which is now Russian soil, in 1935. And um, on, in this building, you see particularly well how, Arte, uh, how Alto dealt with light. So all these skylights, which were meant to bring in uh, natural sunshine, natural sunlight, which were reinforced by um, artificial light sources. So half of the year, when in Finland it's dark, um, instead of the sunlight coming in, the artificial lighting uh, would do the job. Or this is a particularly spectacular um, meeting room um, where he has this, this beautiful undulated wooden ceiling. And I think you can imagine that sitting in such a room gives you a completely different feeling than sitting in a white box. So here again, this idea of how to make it as human and uh, close to the human needs as possible, and also how to bring as much light as possible. And you see here one of his mo probably most emblematic or best known 
products, the, the stool 60. It's also a very interesting uh, pro project because the um, library was um, abandoned after the war. It was not damaged during the war, but it was abandoned afterwards. And it was really an international effort um, to, renovate, um, to renovate the library. So there was an international committee consisting of Russian and Finnish and Swedish and American uh, protagonists who were raising money um, to make it possible that this library would be uh, renovated and made uh, open to the public again. And it was actually opened two years ago, only in uh, October 2013. And, I have to admit that I personally haven't been there, but I've been told it's really a fantastic place and worth a visit. And um, this is also how the a meeting room looks like today. And these are the famous uh, skylights seen from above. Alto did a lot of um, public buildings, schools, churches, offices, but he also did a few private homes, which have become uh, part of the international canon of modernism, and especially the Villa Mayrea, which was a house that he designed for Mayre Gullichsen, his co-founder at Artec and her family, and um, which is, again, one of these uh, projects where Alto, and here I should say the Altos, really did everything. Um, I know Alto, uh, in particular, took care of the interior. Um, here again, every detail, every piece of furniture was chosen by them. The art came <laughs> from the Gullichsons, of course. And also here again, um, a very interesting way of dealing with light, huh? building out an angle to make sure you catch every ray of uh, possible sunlight to bring it into the house. This is a view when you stand in front of the house under the canopy, and you see these elements, these pillars, which are, look very, uh, like, nearly look like found objects. Huh? They look like vernacular architecture from the region. So he manages to combine a very contemporary language um, with very familiar um, materials and forms. 20 years later, it's another private house uh, he designed in the outskirts of Paris for a uh, French art gallerist and collector, Monsieur Louis Carré. And this house was built around the art. So it was, it was a house that should uh, present art and make art breathe at its best. And you see these um, little uh, lights. They're probably something like a historic wall washer because they were throwing the light not uh, down on the floor but on the wall to highlight to highlight the art. It was specifically designed for this house. Or, as, or for example, this table here. I'm going to show you later, was also designed specifically for the uh, Maison Carré. This is how it looks today, and it's actually um, an art center. So all the art, the original art has gone, but all the original furniture is still there, which is, for the, me, the furniture animal is very interesting. And, uh, but they do regular exhibitions, and I think it's also worth a trip, um, set in a beautiful landscape. And uh, last but not least, his own house that the Altos built for themselves in the, in the 1930s in Helsinki, which in the beginning was also their studio. So in this wing of the house, um, the first architectural studio in Helsinki was situated. It was, they had moved down, for, they had former studios in other cities, but this was the first Helsinki studio. And um, inside, um, a very cozy, comfortable, warm place. Um, I think not at all how you would maybe imagine an architect's interior, like the cliche of an architect's interior, the very welcoming place. He also designed uh, many exhibitions. For example, the Finnish Pavilion at the New York, New York World's Fair in the 1930s, which also gained a lot of attention. Um, I heard today that it was really meant to reflect the, the Nordic light, the Aurea Borealis, um, in the way he staggered the, um, the different levels of the pavilion. And he also, together with Aino, participated many times at the Triennale in Milan um, to represent Finland and to show their furniture. So what was so special about their furniture? 
I mean, if you, um, if you think of the modernist movement, it was really, the ambition was to make new furniture for a new time. Huh? Life has to change and the interiors have to change, new materials have to come in, and there should be, um, above all, the possibility to produce uh, furniture in series so that as many people as possible could have access to it and could afford it. And uh, the specificity of the altos is now that they were Finnish. So their material was wood. And um, after first uh, attempts also to work in other materials, this is the material that they dedicated their work to. And um, what you see here are actually more artistic um, exercises. So Alto started in the late 1920s to bend wood to see how far he could push this material, what shape he could give it which then eventually led to his furniture. So the armchair um, I, I showed you before in the tuberculosis um, clinic, like if you look at it, it's nearly like the outline of a, of a traditional club chair, huh? of a traditional armchair, but it's completely empty, huh? it's completely light. It just has these two loops of wood and then this dramatically shaped um, seat, which is only fixed at four points. I think if you look at it today, maybe we're not surprised, but we, we think this is like a modern piece of furniture, but now I think in the 1930s when um, interiors were still quite stuffy and uh, um, maybe also um, more representative, this was, this was radical. This was something no one had seen before. Or also something like this. You know, the, the armchair without the back legs, the so-called cantilever, that was the symbol of the modern movement, but the other designers did it in tubular steel, and he rethought it in, uh, in uh, wood. This one is called the tank chair, because when you look at it from the front, I think you see <laughs> how it relates to a tank. Or the tea trolley, I mean, designed in 1936, um, and still, looks very current, still looks very up to date. Um, he was fascinated by Japan. He's never been there, but he was really fascinated by the Japanese woodwork, and he was a big lover of Great Britain and the British tea culture, which were both at sources of inspiration for this product. And just to put it into a context, so this was the Tonet um, catalog in 1930, 1931. So you see the idea of the cantilever of the time was thought in tubular steel, but Alto wanted it to be out of wood, out of a human warm material that you would like to touch and that would also beautifully age over time. And one core idea in his work was that of creating standard components. So I said before it was all about producing products in series so that it could be made available to a large group of people. So it meant rather than doing unique products for each user, his goal was to find individual components that could then be used to make many different products. And um, maybe his core invention was the so-called L-leg, um, which he developed together with a Finnish uh, cabinet maker, Mr. Korhonen. So it's a solid, piece of wood in which uh, slits are being cut and then veneer sheets are being glued. And once the glue is in, it can be under pressure and heat and a little bit of humidity, it can be bent into a 90 degree angle. So here you see the different steps. And in the end you have this component, you have this leg, which he compared to being a little sister of the uh, architectural column. So it basically means you have a vertical element on which you can put all kinds of horizontal elements to make different products. For example, the stool, with three legs or four legs, but also chairs, which use the same technique for the legs, tables, obviously. I think at some point there were four sizes of the leg for more than 50 different products. And yet, each individual product is stronger than the system. You don't look at the table 
and then the chair, you say, oh my God, again, that leg. You see a chair and the table. He then continued. He cut the leg in two and put it in a 90 degree angle, which again allowed him to create tabletops. And then the next step is the so-called X leg, where um, it's being cut into smaller segments and combined into this fan-shaped leg which was, for example, used um, at this table, which we saw at the Maison Carré uh, in the picture before. Lighting was not only important to him in terms of an architectural ingredient, um, but also lighting fixtures. So this is his studio in Helsinki, and you see this balcony here which was set up specifically to test lighting. So they were hanging down here, the different light fixtures to test the effect. And um, I think what's quite interesting about uh, um, Alto's lighting fixtures is that he always works with direct and indirect light. So he, and he tries to work with materials that would reflect the light as much as possible. So obviously with this, you don't only have light coming down here, but you have here the perforation and then you will have like a, um, like, a, like a crown of light coming out here, plus any light source in the room will be reflected in the brass. And here you will have come, light come out here, here, at every layer, indirect light comes out. And I think this is a quality of the Nordic uh, designers that they're so familiar with the problem of not having sunlight, that they're very inventive when it comes, of, comes to bringing natural light into the interior, uh, sorry, artificial light into the interior. Quality of imperfection. What you see here is a stack of finished birch, um, which has been growing for 50 to 80 years before it's being cut down, and then it's being dried outside for about one and a half years until the level of humidity is so low that you can actually uh, work with it and make furniture out of it. This was the Korhonen factory in the 1930s, uh, where, the, where ever since um, the Alto products have been produced. Um, and you see, it was a very manual process in the beginning. And now, 80 years later, it is still a pretty manual process. <laughs> um, although you see there's also a lot of machines involved. I would call it a semi-industrial process. This is, for example, um, uh, not a machine to, to bend the loop for the tea trolley. Or here's the L leg um, production. But it means that every product, first of all, is made of a natural material, and a lot of human people or human interactions are happening before the product is ready. So every product is a bit different from the other, and we actually think this is not a problem or a flaw. We think this is beautiful. And uh, wood is also a product that ages, huh? that takes patina. So these are stools from the 1940s. And um, you can see that they've had a, <laughs> have a, had a long life. So they've spent some 70 years out there. Um, but we think it's also interesting to see these traces of life. So we've actually opened a, a shop in, in Helsinki, which we call the Second Cycle where we bring these products that have already had a life back into circulation. Um, and it's obviously, a, how shall I say, a privilege to say, we've been doing it for 80 years, so you can have a new one, or you can have the old one, or you can see how this is gonna look um, if you paint it yourself, or because this is also things that people have done. Huh? The, the green color is someone has chosen that and has painted it at some point like this. So starting from Alto and um, his design approach, Artec has built up um, a collection 
um, by products of several Finnish masters. And that they're actually all represented in the, in the exhibition here at the Hermitage. So Alto was born in 1898. And then here we have um, Ilmari Tapiovara, who was 16 years younger. So it was half a generation after. And then here we have Tapio Virkala and uh, Yuri Kukapuro and Ero Arnio. And these two gentlemen were the students of this gentleman. So they're all in a, in a lineage and somehow connected to each other, but they stand for very different designs. I'm, I'm just going to show you a few. Ilmari Tapiovara was not a trained architect, like many other people who did design or furniture design at this time. He was a trained designer. And um, his first important project was the Domus Academica, which was a university um, in Helsinki right after the war. And he and his wife, who was also a designer, um, won the competition to furnish it. Um, and um, for this, they developed the so-called Domus chair, which actually became a very successful export chair. So here you see um, like a, uh, like a trade uh, documentation where it all shows how easily it can be stacked and how easily it can be uh, shipped abroad and dismantled. And this is the Domo's chair, and here comes the lounge chair, uh, Domo's lounge chair. And you see it's aesthet aesthetically maybe in a different uh, tradition than Alto, but also here the idea of producing something in series. This is not about making a unique object, but finding a way um, to producing something um, economically um, so that it can be spread as wide as possible. Kiki, that's much later, 1960s. And the story was actually that someone called um, Tapiovara and said, hey, I have tons of this tubular steel with this oval um, shape. Can't you do something with it? And then he designed around it uh, a group of furniture, the Kiki collection, which contains uh, many different things from benches to tables and chairs. Now, Yuri Kukapuro, now the next generation, he's now 82 years old, um, a wonderful, wonderful man, still designing every day. And um, he also always had the human user in, at the core of his, uh, of his intentions. So he had a strong ergonomic approach. He was trying to design chairs that would support the movement of the person using it. And the product that we have in our collection now is the so-called Caruselli chair. Here's a picture from the 60s, which looks very much like swinging London. And um, the story was that one evening, um, he went home in the dark Finnish winter, and he was a bit illuminated. And he fell into the snow. And when he got up, um, he saw the shape that he had left in the snow, and that gave him the idea. But this is, of course, not true, because he's a serious designer. <laughs> and he was actually playing with his daughter. They were doing snow angels. And, uh, and then he was working with a um, metal structure, like with a grid uh, that he was putting on a chair, sitting inside, taking the imprint to make this chair. And now we make another jump. Um, Konstantin Gritschic, a German designer, he, um, Artex started working with international designers in the 1990s because I think from the beginning, Artex was decidedly Finnish and international. Remember, the idea was to conquer the world. Um, and since the 1990s, we bring also um, international designers to work with the Artex heritage. And Konstantin Gritschic designed uh, two years ago, or one year ago, actually, a swivel chair, but he uses here these techniques to bend the backrest are the same techniques that we use to bend, for example, the Paimio um, armchair. So it's a continuation of the techniques developed in the 1930s. Well, here we have another happy contemporary designer. This is Ronan Bourlec, one of the two Bourlec brothers, French designers. 
in front of our Artex store in, in Finland at the presentation of a new collection that we've developed together. And the Burolegs, like Alto, are strong system thinkers. So they were very interested in this idea of finding one component, one structural idea with which they could build all different kinds of products. And for them, it was a metal loop. And the word kari means arc in Finnish. So these were first prototypes of the legs, which were then uh, led to this collection of desks and tables, um, but also like wall shelves, like a console, a larger desk, or also a small round wall shelf. And I think also here it's a system, no? the idea of the loop that can be used for different products, but each product is stronger than the system. You don't look at this and say, oh, but that's the loop that I've already seen in the table. I mean, how boring, that's too much. And that's the full collection. So I would like to come back to this ambition of our founders um, for increased worldwide activity. What you see here was Artex distribution map in 1935, and that's something I'm personally still, um, yeah, I still can't believe it. Like they had partners in Australia, in Johannesburg, all over Europe, in Latin America, in, in, in uh, the United States. So already in 1935, um, they had this international network of people who believed in their ideas and who wanted to be part of it. And um, over these last 80 years, Artec has really become part of something like a popular culture. And there are many different um, people who have either worked with Artec or for Artec or they relate to Artec in their own work or they use the products in their own work. And we've done a little exercise. We've put together this like Artec Cosmos where you see starting from the founders. So in here we have the founders. We've created this like stellar, stellar system where we have art, photography, design, there's fashion somewhere down here, architecture, publication, industry. And we have researched all these people who have, yeah, somehow been in contact or collaboration with Artec and the founders. And I'll show you some examples. This is a cafe in Zurich that Alvaro Alto did together with the artist Max Ernst in the 1930s. And you see this zebra fabric, uh, this very exotic fabric, which we actually still have in a collection, the beautiful uh, mural by Max Ernst here. And uh, after this, there's many other artists who have used Artec in their work or made reference to it. Or this is um, uh, an anecdote that Frank Gehry, the great architect, tells that when he was 16, he went to these lectures at the University of Toronto, and in 1946, he remembers that there was this guy coming on the stage with a chair. He was also talking about some buildings, but he, Gary, was really fascinated by the chair. And this chair somehow stayed in his mind. And then years later, he went to Finland and he visited Alvaro Alto and he asked, were you by any chance in Toronto in 1946? And sure enough, he was. And he said for many years, he's carried this image in his head, the man and the chair. Another great architect, Shigeru Ban, the Japanese architect who won the Pritzker Prize last year, um, he collaborated with Artec in 2007. He designed a pavilion for us, and he also designed a product that we still have in the collection, a system um, for, to create chairs and benches. And he also says that without encountering Alto's architecture, he would not have been able to discover his own style. This is at the Dover Street Market in Ginza. The Dover Street Market is the flagship store of the Japanese fashion label 
Comme des Garçons. And uh, this was an installation by Klein Ditham Architects to celebrate uh, the 80th anniversary of Stool 60. This was an art installation by the German artist Tobias Rehberger at the uh, Venice Biennial. It was called What You Love Also Makes You Cry. And um, it was this kind of psychedelic picture that you could walk into and where then obviously you would uh, <laughs> come across the Arctic furniture. And it, it's a cafeteria and it's still there and it's still in action. And actually that year in 2009, it won the award for the best um, project for the Golden Lion. And he later on did another cafe in Turku, which is even more hard to decipher. So, so here, I mean, maybe I can give you some clues <laughs> of where to find uh, the furniture. And I think this was up during Turku was the cultural capital of Europe. And it was also a cafe um, open to the public. Um, there's also many public uh, places where you can come across um, Arctic furniture. For example, in this restaurant in Helsinki, which was actually designed by the Altos in 37, and which pretty much still looks exactly like this. But you can find also Tapiovara's Domus chair in London at the Royal Opera House, or at Starbucks <laughs> in uh, Helsinki. This is the Swatch group um, in Tokyo and in their lobby. They've chosen Arctic furniture. Or this is a beautiful library in Brooklyn um, where the color of the chairs had to match uh, the wooden paneling, which was a historic, um, was an historic paneling. Or this, uh, Jewish theater, theater in Stockholm, which is like a zebra, zebra orgy. <laughs> and last but not least, our, one of our latest projects here in Russia. I don't know who's already been at the garage at the Museum for Contemporary Art that uh, uh, Rem Cole has built. And in the uh, cafe, you will find uh, Kiki. But then there's obviously all the private houses, which I think is also what the founders intended, no? to create these functional but beautiful products for the everyday. And uh, I think these pictures, which we just randomly took from our Instagram uh, account, shows that it can be a happy barbecue <laughs> or, uh, or just uh, maybe someone admiring art where you could come across um, Arctic furniture. So I think to a certain extent, um, they have succeeded. Um, Arctic has become um, part of the popular culture and it has found its way into the world. Thank you. Thank you.